Welcome to the Mind and Matter podcast. I'm your host, Nick Jacomis, and today I'll be speaking with Brian Murarescu. Brian is the author of the New York Times best-selling book, The Immortality Key, The Secret History of the Religion with No Name. Brian is fluent in ancient Greek, ancient Latin, and Sanskrit, and spent over a decade putting together an incredible story about the intentional use of psychoactive plants in the ancient world, including scientific evidence for the ritual use of spiked beers and wines. I spoke at length with Brian, covering topics related to the book, including the use of psilocybin mushrooms in the present day to treat end-of-life anxiety, how mystery schools in the ancient world, such as Eleusis, may have have utilized psychedelic beverages, the evidence for the potential widespread use of psychoactive plants in ritual settings in ancient times, and how all of this may have influenced early Christianity and the development of Western civilization. And towards the end, we discussed how psychedelic drugs may induce brain states similar to those produced during real near-death experiences. If you enjoy this conversation, you can show your support by liking or subscribing. Hey everyone, I want to take just a minute to tell you about an app I am partnering with called Readwise. Readwise is an app that organizes and helps you get the most out of your digital highlights. I use it to organize all the highlights I make in my digital books on my Kindle. And so if you're like me and you make a lot of highlights and you like to revisit them often to refresh your memory, Readwise is the perfect app. You can also take photos of any physical books you've highlighted and upload those. It also has cool features that allow you to share your favorite highlights and quotes from books on social media, and it syncs with note-taking apps like like Evernote, Notion, and Rome. You can tag, search, and organize your notes and highlights on Readwise, and it helps you connect ideas in new ways and retain more of what you read. So if you click the link in the episode description, you can get Readwise for free for two months when you sign up for their annual plan. That plan is only $7.99 per month, and it's a relatively new app, so they're adding new features often, and if you sign up for the annual plan today, you can lock in that price, which will stay at $7.99 even if the price increases in the future as they add more. So if you do a lot of highlighting and note taking and you want a good way to organize all that information, check out the link in the episode description. And with that, here is my conversation with Brian. Well, thanks for joining me, Brian. I really appreciate it appreciate you doing this and uh, congrats on the success of your book, The Immortality Key so far. I know it's doing very well. Thank you. Good to be here, Nick. Um, it's a great book. So I read it almost in one sitting. Um, it's an area that I find fascinating at multiple levels. And I think it was a really unique book. Um, a traditional academic could not have done this um, just based on how many things were synthesized. But I thought we would start with the quote in ancient Greek at the very beginning of the book. And I would love if you could tell us what that quote is, what it means, and why Why is that the beginning? Sure. Um, so let me start with the quote. It goes something like this. An pethanis, prin pethanis, dentha pethanis, otan pethanis. And it means if you die before you die, you won't die when you die. And you, you can find that on a plaque at the St. Paul's Monastery at Mount Athos in Greece, one of the holiest sites in, in orthodoxy. And, and, I, and I think it harkens back to an ancient Greek uh, philosophy about this concept of dying before dying, whether by psychedelics or not, in this infinite toolkit of the archaic techniques of ecstasy, uh, you know, plant medicine being just one among many. Uh, I think something you find again and again, including in ancient Greece, not just in other traditional societies, but at the roots of you know, what became Western civilization at the roots mm -hmm. of us, there is this sense that to die in this lifetime uh, or to achieve a sense of timelessness, immortality in the here and now is the real trick. That's, that's the real secret. And so that is the key of the immortality key. That's fascinating. I mean, you hear a lot today, you know, pr prior to your book coming out, you would hear about this kind of thing from people who are really into meditation Mm -hmm. talking about Eastern traditions. Uh, you'll hear about it from psychonauts or people taking high doses of psychedelics at a music festival. But what your book really started to show me was that maybe this is not exceptional in the Western world. It actually goes all the way back to the beginning. And maybe what's exceptional is the, the absence of use of these substances to achieve this sort of quote-unquote death. Um, 
And, and that was really one thing that fascinated me about the book. Uh, me too. And the, the reason I started writing the book is because in 2007, I started reading uh, some of the early uh, results coming out of the, the Johns Hopkins experiments mm. uh, around psilocybin, the, the, the compound in magic mushrooms. And again, what you immediately see are people having godlike experiences or mystical experiences or mystico mimetic experiences without getting lost in the jargon, mm -hmm. experiences that transform people um, in six hours in short order on one and only dose sometimes not repeated, um, like Dinah Baser, who I profile in the book, an atheist mm -hmm. who claimed that she felt as if she was being bathed in God's love, uh, which, is, which is extraordinary. So, you know, when I started reading those, those kinds of results, um, what you see again and again is the, this confrontation with death. And it immediately reminded me of the confrontation with death at Eleusis, mm -hmm. which was the, the spiritual capital of the ancient Greco-Roman world, both for the Greeks and for the Romans. You, you would go to this sanctuary essentially to overcome the fear of death or to transcend the body or to become an immortal. Again, in the here and now, not, mm -hmm. not that an afterlife is something to, to, to wait on or to expect, uh, but that the, the, the concept of immortality is something to be discovered in the here and now while you're in the flesh and blood so that when the physical body does waste away, you transition back into that sense of timelessness. It's not a foreign experience. And the, and the experience itself was, uh, was the key. So uh, Eleusis, what, so what was Eleusis really? And what did we know? What had we known for a long time prior to your book? And, and how does that set up like why you actually set out this investigation? Good question. So, so what we what what we know, I think it's fair to say that Eleusis was probably the most famous and certainly the the longest lasting mystery tradition of the ancient world. And my and my, my fast and dirty definition of a mystery tradition mm -hmm. is a secret set of rites or ceremonies that somehow involve death and rebirth. Again, we're mm -hmm. coming back to this death concept. Thanatology is my favorite phrase for that. You know, the, the, the study of death and dying. Uh, and so in these ceremonies, there would be some sense of dissolving that ordinary mm -hmm. uh, sense of the self and being reborn into a new identity. I mean, taking on new I the, uh, the identity of a god or a goddess, mm -hmm. actually. And so Eleusis was just one of many mystery traditions but I say it was the mo most famous because it was administered by the Greek state. We think for uh, about 2000 years. So from 1500 BC to the fourth century AD, i.e. as long as Christianity itself has been around, mm -hmm. there was this predecessor religion that beckoned to the best and brightest of antiquity from Plato all the way to Marcus Aurelius. Uh, and what they all did was make this pilgrimage from Athens 13 miles northwest to the sanctuary at Eleusis. Uh, we don't really know the sequence of events, but we mm -hmm. know that some kind of potion called the Kukion was involved and that it was drunk by these initiates um, once in their life and only once in their life. Did they then have access to the secret of secrets, uh, to, the, to the mystery of mysteries, which was the confrontation with death and the, the discovery of their of their immortality, it was it was said that there was this vision there, and whatever happened by whatever means, it was this vision, this beatific vision, that convinced these folks that they would live forever, or that or that they would never die, um, and it disappears in the fourth century A.D. to be replaced by Christianity. So was this? So it's happening from around the time of Plato all the way through the time of Marcus Aurelius. Were they participating in it? How, was this was this something for the nobility? Was this something that a small sect of people participated in? How common was it? I get asked that question a lot. Um, I think I'm 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 confident saying at some point over those many centuries uh, mm -hmm. there were there would have been millions of initiates. Uh, the testimony that comes down to us obviously is from uh, well-known figures like like Plato and Marcus Aurelius or Aristotle. Mm -hmm. who said that, you know, initiates went there not to learn something, but to experience something. Again, mm -hmm. that, that there was something experienced there. And you had to pay some dues to the hereditary families who monopolized these rights. So it, it wasn't a cheap affair, and it wasn't necessarily easy. Mm -hmm. And you had to take time off to uh, go through it, at least the, the nine days and nights you would spend in and around the fall equinox on your initiation, but we think that there was lots of preparation in advance as well. So you're, you're talking about some serious time 
uh, doing something that is fairly irrational. Uh, you know, you're not you're not paying the bills by by making a pilgrimage to Eleusis. So I, mm-hmm. I don't know how exclusive it was, but technically it was open to anybody who hadn't committed murder and who spoke some Greek, uh, including women. As a matter mm-hmm. of fact, at the beginning, mm-hmm. it, it was exclusively a women's rite of initiation. So I'm not sure how exclusive or not. I, I think it, it spoke to lots of people over those many centuries. Mm-hmm. But it wasn't, it wasn't really a, a secret. People knew that this was a thing and, and it was available if you wanted to, if you could make that investment. Sure. The fact that it existed was very much not a secret. I think yeah. what, what happened what happened inside the temple dedicated to Demeter, what, what happened when you drank the potion uh, were, were, was very much considered secret. And, to, and to, to speak about it was to subject yourself to the penalty of death. Wow. Okay. So they took it. They took that part seriously. Yeah, they, 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 were, they were pretty amped up on this stuff. Yeah. yeah. And so I guess that's why for so long, um, really up until now, um, we haven't known the details there. So we know that something amazing is happening that people are talking about at some level. They're drinking some kind of potion, but we've never known what was in the potion, what it might have been. And, and so can you tell us the story of what you ended up finding from archaeochemical evidence and how, how that transpired? Right. So we, we don't know much. We had all these hints and clues. We, we know there's some kind of vision involved. And, mm-hmm. you know, none, by the way, none of this is unique to me at all. Uh, mm-hmm. I'm, 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 I kind of follow in the scholarship of Wasson, um, Hoffman, and Ruck, who released this book, The Road to Eleusis, in 1978. Uh, and that, that's Gordon Wasson, the J.P. Morgan banker turned ethnomycologist, actually the guy who discovers, I mean, rediscovers psilocybin containing mushrooms and in 1955. Them- Brings them yeah. to the United States consciousness, basically. Yeah, and unwittingly sparks the psychedelic revolution yeah. <laughs> of the 60s, to get, together with Hoffman, by the way, yeah. who synthesizes LSD in 1938. Uh, and they, 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 they roped in this young classicist, Carl Ruck, who was only a couple of years older than me at the time in 1978. He was the chair of classics at Boston University. And the three of them, uh, although the idea had been out there, uh, they weren't necessarily the first, but, but they really popularized this idea of a psychedelic potion, a -hmm. psychedelic kukion at the center of these mysteries. And they were excoriated for daring to suggest that Plato at all were just, you know, high, high, uh, high on drugs when they were uh, founding everything we take for granted today in Western civilization. So um, I understand part of that. I mean, the, the evidence they, they amass is pretty decent. I mean, obviously Hoffman was a a kick-ass chemist. Mm -hmm. Um, Wasson, for uh, the amateur, though he was, was a you know a pretty interesting anthropologist. Had traveled the world, tracking down information on these kinds of mysteries, ancient and modern. And and Carl Ruck, you know, trained at Harvard and Yale like mm-hmm. no slouch at the classics, and put together a compelling argument from the literary data. But mm-hmm. what was missing was the hard botanical chemical evidence. So I spent years and years and years searching these journals and talking to people, trying to figure out if there was any hard evidence for this allegedly psychedelic kukion. And I actually found it. That, uh, so that's amazing. What were, what were the major candidates? I mean, based on their background, you've got Hoffman, who's obviously the guy who m- synthesizes LSD, which comes from ergot. You've got the experience of others with psilocybe mushrooms in Central America. What were their, was there a favored uh, candidate compound from, from that group? So in in their book, The Road to Eleusis, they they really focus on ergot, okay. um, and, and and by extension the ergolines, which is to say, you know, the alkaloids that are derived from ergot, not just LSD, by the way, which is where LSD comes from. Mm-hmm. LSD is synthesized from cultures of ergot, which is this naturally occurring fungus. Uh, it's very common. It's been around for a while. Um, it, it may have been there from the very beginning of agriculture. It's, you know, it's a pain in the ass today for those who are trying to brew beer. You really can't get rid of it. Um, under the right conditions, the, this stuff grows on the grain, infects the grain, um, and can be toxic. So mm-hmm. even today, you need to be really careful with it. And there were all, all kinds of bouts of ergotism throughout the Middle Ages associated with this, with this funky fungus. Uh, so, but, but they focused on it, I think, I think largely because of Hoffman and all of his, his experience with it. Yeah. Um, uh, it, you know, in the abstract, it's just it's a very elegant theory because of how common it is. It's it's you know it runs into problems because the chemistry is complicated. Yeah. And even 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 today, despite the evidence that I found, even even today, you know, a properly visionary 
Kukion hasn't been recreated in the laboratory. We, we don't know what, what that, that active alkaloid was. Um, but nonetheless, I went on the hunt for ergot to see if there was any kind of ergotized, well, beer specifically, because what we're talking about is some kind of brew um, mm -hmm. in, the, in this ancient hymn from the seventh century BC. It talks about the, the ingredients of the kukion being barley, water, and mint. And according to Wasson, Hoffman, and Ruck, they, they, they thought those were the, you know, kind of um, half ingredients. The mm -hmm. you know, it was hiding the secret ergot behind that, that the barley would have been infected barley. Uh, and so in looking for, for data on what that could have been, I eventually came across this archaeological site in Spain where they unearthed this very ancient Greek sanctuary, or at the very least Hellenistic, influenced by ancient Greeks. Mm -hmm. And in the second century BC, they unearthed, uh, well, in the 90s, they unearthed a, a, a chalice that dated back to the second century BC. And it tested positive for the remains of beer and ergot, exactly as was hypothesized in 1978. So the very first hard scientific data to, to support this theory in 42 years. And so one of the things that struck me as I started to read this was, you know, at first I was assuming okay, maybe there was this specific group of people in certain times, certain places making these concoctions. But based on my reading, it was actually the rule, not the exception, to mix things with beers and wines in the ancient world. Is that, is that accurate? That I didn't know that when I started writing the book, um, and not, not even 12 years ago. I mean, that, that, that kind of dawned over time as I started reading more and more studies um, and getting more into the archaeochemistry. Uh, and um, uh, Andrew Coe at MIT, one of the world's leading archaeochemists, uh, mm -hmm. it, was, it was his study at Tel Cabri in Galilee from around 1700 BC when he unearthed all this spiked wine that really kind of got me thinking about the, the beverages of antiquity. And as I started talking to him and others, it did eventually dawn on me that, that, that beer and wine was routinely spiked mm -hmm. with this stuff. And, and not, just, not just ergot, like we found from the second century BC, um, but if you look at a manuscript like Dioscorides from the first century AD, mm -hmm. at the same time the gospels are being written, lots of uh, weird recipes and formulas for spiking wine with, with all kinds of things. Uh, some of them visionary and quite psychedelic. In fact, in Greek, Dioscorides even talks about spiking wine uh, with a kind of nightshade that he calls uh, the thing that would produce not unpleasant visions. I mean, so, you know, and that's, that's as close to psychedelic as you can get. Um, yeah. Ooh, aedais fantasias. Uh, so well, we know the technology was out there. I mean, it's still an open question how prevalent. I mean, of course there was table wine and, you know, and table beer, but um, Pat McGovern at UPenn refers to these beverages as the universal palliatives that, mm -hmm. that even for medicine, um, uh, you know, you would spike your wine to take your medicine instead of going to the drugstore and popping a couple pills with a glass of water. I mean, the, their, their wine was just re a really versatile product, right? From mm -hmm. nutritional to medicinal yeah. to, yeah. you know, really religious use. Yeah. And the other thing that struck me was, I, I guess at first when I was thinking about this, I was like, wow, like they must have had, how, how could they have come up with this, learned how to mix things like this? But then as I really thought about it, it actually made a lot of sense. Almost anywhere you look on the planet, right? You've got, you've got people using, performing what is essentially proto-chemistry. So even though they don't have a theory of the periodic table, they know how to mix things in precise proportions in a very systematic way. And you know, whether it's ayahuasca in the Amazon or psilocybe mushrooms and peyote in Central and North America or Amanita muscaria in Eurasia, everywhere you look in ancient times, people had quite significant botanical knowledge mm. and they certainly had the time, right? They mm. weren't distracted by, you know, having a cell phone in their pocket or all of these things. And in many ways, this struck me as basically a, a proto-science, perhaps. People knew to a large extent, how to mix different combinations of, of plant material together to achieve pharmacological effects, even if they weren't explicitly aware of the underlying chemistry. Uh, I think that's a great way to put it. Yeah, I, I would call it a, a rigorous science, even more than a proto-science. Mm -hmm. they, they may not have understood, I mean, I don't know if they did or not. It's, it's really complex stuff. I'm not sure how much of the chemistry they knew or not. They certainly knew the, the botany. Yeah. Um, that's what really impressed me about the, the, the paper on Tel Cabri 
that um, Andrew Co released in 2014. There's this great line about how spiking wine with this many ingredients, and I, I won't list them off, but it's it's all kinds of things that you wouldn't ordinarily think would spike wine. Everything mm-hmm. from honey and and storax to terebinth and cypress uh, and all all kinds of plants and species. Uh, but you know, to 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 spike wine with that many things, uh, they say in the paper, is obviously emblematic of a very sophisticated understanding of the botanical landscape and the desire to really balance out uh, what they say a uh, preservation uh, mm-hmm. palatability and also psychoactivity yeah um so they, they they knew what they were doing uh you know it's it's not easy to do what they were doing and with respect to you know, potentially toxic plants especially like those mm-hmm. mentioned in dioscorides these nightshade plants like henbane and mandrake etc yeah. i mean the, the dose has to be precise are, right yeah, they're very clear. The ancient authors are very clear that to overdose or to get this wrong, uh, like mandrake, for example, mm-hmm. that if you get your measurements wrong, it's fatal. It is yeah. a fatal potion. So they clearly knew what they were doing. So you find evidence of ergotized beer in Spain, not in Greece. So why, how, how is this? How did you get to Spain? What do you think that means? It wasn't in Eleusis in Greece. It was in Spain. And then where remind us what the timeline is here relative to say the the high tide of Eleusis. Yeah, uh, I have no idea why it winds up in in Spain. On I mean, which, which is part of the reason it hasn't been reported before, at least at least widely reported, because it, it's the last place you expect to find the Greek mysteries. So mm-hmm. again, Eleusis anywhere from fifteen hundred BC to the fourth century AD. I mean, the classical period of the figures where we're talking about is fifth, fourth century BC. So Mm -hmm. roughly 2,500 years ago, Uh, the, this chapel in Spain is pretty confidently dated to the second century BC. So not too long after the classical period. Um, I mean, there were still mysteries happening in ancient Greece in the second century BC, obviously. Uh, We know that Cicero in the first century BC, the Roman order is initiated and he calls Eleusis the most exceptional and divine thing that Athens ever produced. And so in between Plato and Cicero is this place in Spain, which, you know, you don't expect it to be there. I was just doing random Googling, to be quite honest. I was, I was Googling ergot in different languages because there, there's lots of words in German for it. And I figured, you know, if there's all this lore in Germany, maybe elsewhere, uh, the word in, in Spanish is cornezuelo de centeno. And I, I, I was looking for anything that contained that phrase. And that's how I came across this archeological site in Catalonia in Northeast Spain. And one thing led to another. I'm, I'm reading these papers that I haven't seen before. And I, I call the archeologist Riqueta Pons mm-hmm. and the archeobotanist who worked on this, this, this baby chalice, uh, Jordi Treserras. And I just bother the hell out of them. <laughs> For a couple years and you know i ruin their lives uh but they you know we, we strike up this great relationship and i'm just trying to diligence everything there and you know all the pieces add up every time i ask a question yeah. there there's an there's an answer and all the pieces line up for whatever the hell was happening there 2200 years ago it was some kind of reflection of the classical mysteries. All the elements are there, the Demeter and Persephone and Hecate, all these characters, even Dionysus, we, you know, mm-hmm. they, they found a vase uh, with something like the Dionysian elements on it, uh, a very Greek vase and a very Greek pillar inside the sanctuary. I mean, it, just, it all lines up. Yeah, I was, um, I definitely want you to talk about Dionysus, but first, well, A, you, you talked about bothering these people. Um, and, and that's a, that's actually a great technique. I bother people to figure stuff out all the time. But, you know, I, I and met most people in the world who've now read your book, which is an, it's a New York Times bestseller at this point, right? Yes. So congrats on that. You, you've definitely brought uh, a lot of people to this. Uh, people who would have never known that this kind of research is going on. And I assume this re- research is not going on very much. Like this is fairly mm. obscure. Um, I'm guessing it's hard to get research dollars. How mm. how many people were looking into this stuff and doing what you're referring to as archaeobotany or archaeochemistry? Not many. And yeah. specifically, when I asked Andrew Coe, how many folks are out there like him who has, you know, dual training, Mm -hmm. not only in chemistry, but also classics like me, Um, i.e. the kind of person who, you know, doesn't just overlook the kukion or the idea of a spiked wine. I mean, he Mm -hmm. understands not just the chemistry and testing this stuff, but the the ritual ceremonies and the settings and the cultural atmosphere in which these, uh, these potions were relevant to these people, extremely relevant. 
And when I asked him, I mean, he basically, you know, there, there aren't many people out there doing this. And as a matter of fact, uh, you know, to kind of drive the point home, um, I won't mention the, the second find about the spiked wine, but when it came to the ergotized beer, um, the guy who did the testing, Jordi in Spain, he's no longer an archaeobotanist, by the way. Mm-hmm. Uh, at wow. some point in his career, after his PhD, he was prolifically publishing on this stuff for about 10 years. And now he's doing something else. Uh, and he's quite happy, but you know, there, there's no career path for yeah. him, yeah. Uh, or at least, at least not one that, that he perceived. And it's a story that comes up again and again and again. It, it's so funny. After I published the book, I got all these notes from archaeologists, PhDs, who are in love with this stuff and had no career track. You yeah. know, it's, it's very hard to get funding for this stuff, exactly as you say. Yeah, I, maybe we'll circle back to that. I mean, from my own research career, so I spent about 10 years in academia doing biology and neuroscience where, you know, you can get funding. And even then, it's it's very difficult and very grueling to constantly write grants. You know, the, the head of a lab is really like the CEO of a small startup and you're just raising money constantly to make it all possible. Yeah. But that's, you know, when you have an NIH or a Department of Defense um, willing to fund top dollar research in neuroscience or something like that or engineering, mm-hmm. um, there's no, you know, there's there's no funding like that for ancient archaeochemistry. So I, I definitely have a respect for people who who have done that work. Uh, me too. And, you know, Andrew, uh, at, he's now at MIT. Uh, but he's largely been doing it um, on, on, on the side, developing mm. all these resources and developing, you know, this, this platform to really record all this data. It's, it's been his side project uh, with no real home for archaeochemistry. You know, you can't get a PhD in the yeah. hunt for ancient intoxicants. I wish you could, and maybe someday you will, but yeah. you know, um, for, for him and for, and for me, you know, having to navigate all these silos in academia to figure out if there was any way to correlate this data, it's, you know, it's, this is part of the reason it took me uh, 12 years. Yeah. And, you know, another, another big piece of the book, one that I didn't see coming at all until I got to it was, you know, the reason a lot of the stuff has been mysterious and unknown is not simply because you're talking about, you know, the need to synthesize all sorts of different stuff across a wide range of time periods. You know, there's the archaeology, there's the linguistics, there's the history, there's the actual chemistry and botany side of this. But a lot of this stuff, as we'll come to, was actively suppressed. And that was something, I mean, it clicked for me when I read about the Catholic Church and the suppression of, of a lot of this stuff, but that was not something I actually saw coming. Um, and that's something I want to circle back to. But, okay, we're in Spain. It's, it's a couple thousand years ago. People are using ergotized beer. You mentioned Dionysus. Who, who is Dionysus and how does Dionysus connect to this concept in the book of the pagan continuity hypothesis? Right. So Dionysus was a fun guy. Um, <laughs> he, he, was, he was as fun as Jesus was a couple thousand years ago. So uh, he's, he's the god of, of ecstasy and theater and obviously wine but also mystical rapture. I mean, he, he was a god of the mysteries, his own mysteries, right? Separate from Eleusis. And at some point he kind of wends his way into the temple at Eleusis as the holy child of Persephone, the goddess of the underworld. But he very much had his own mysteries as well. Again, largely followed by women, the, the Mynads, uh, who would uh, you know, go, uh, go into ecstasy on behalf of their god. The, the, this concept of enthusiasm, being filled with the spirit of the God by mm-hmm. any means possible, biting on some kind of psychoactive ivy, drinking the white wine, sucking down, uh, you know, um, some kind of psychotropic goat blood, all kinds of all kinds of fun stuff we see in the literature. Uh, but again, the one the one common motif is this wine. I mean, there was a wine god uh, in ancient Greece for centuries. Obviously, he follows on the other wine gods in Egypt and the Near East that I talk about, uh, mm-hmm. Osiris and El, and you can follow this trajectory right into Jesus. And this is this is the pagan continuity hypothesis. Not that, not that Jesus is some kind of amalgamation of all these Near Eastern fertility gods and gods yeah. of wine, but if you specifically focus on the connection between Dionysus and Jesus, it's just one thing after another. You know, the sons of God, born of the Virgin, who introduce the vine into their mysteries, who die and are resurrected. I mean, mm-hmm. uh, it's just this laundry list of motifs uh, that pops up. And that's particularly meaningful to me because of the Greek connection. Mm-hmm. Uh, you, you can draw parallels to many other gods, and, and other folks have done that. 
Um, include, I mean, you know, 100 years ago they were doing that. But but the Dionysus connection is is really interesting. And so I follow a lot of scholarship by this guy Dennis McDonald, who wrote this great book a couple of years ago, the Dionysian Gospel. And, and and it's he who lists out all these really interesting parallels. It's fascinating. Um, so do you think so? A lot of these religious traditions where you have you have a deity in, in the religious story that in the story literally is killed and comes back to life. Do you think that's related to the concept of, quote, dying before you die? That when you take some of these substances, there's this metaphorical death, your ego is literally being dissolved, you're being put into a brain state where you're perceiving things in a way that's very different from the way that you normally do in your normal waking consciousness. It gives you the opportunity to, quote, unquote, rebirth yourself and reinvent yourself, you know, presumably for the better. Um, but somewhere it appears to have been lost. I mean, when I was a kid, you know, and I was going to Catholic school for a while, I'm not a religious person, but I had to go to, to Catholic school and, and learn, learn all of that stuff. There was no, you know, you learn about Jesus and he's dying for our sins and he's resurrecting, but it really almost sounds like a superhero story. Like he comes back to life um, to save you uh, from yourself, but there was no concept of rebirth of the individual. Mm. That that somehow there was no concept in my education early on that that story was supposed to be an allegory for your own death and rebirth. Um, right. So it seems like somewhere along the way, at least in the West, that that was sort of lost. I suppose so. Or or you know we're not reading Joseph Campbell enough. Or or yeah. or it took or <laughs> or it took or it took Joe Campbell to come along and write the hero with a thousand faces, mm -hmm. and to remind us that the story of Jesus is the story of us, and the story of Dionysus is the story of us, and that the power of myth, right, uh, mm -hmm. is is about examining these stories and these rituals, right. Uh, two sides of the same mythic coin. The not not just the story, but the ritual behind it, the drinking yeah. of the blood. Uh, to remind us that that this is about us and this is this is about our death and resurrection that we shall die to our animal nature and be born as a spiritual being that we are spiritual beings having this human experience um, I do think that the early Christians thought um, allegorically about this stuff uh, because mm -hmm. I know we know the Greeks did for example we yeah. know that and we'll talk about Plotinus later, but we know the Greeks had a very sophisticated understanding of these stories. As a matter of fact, there was this Neoplatonic movement in mm -hmm. the early days of Christianity, uh, or at least into the third century AD, where they were reading Greek literature already as allegory. They yeah. were reading uh, the, the adventures of Odysseus as a story of spiritual salvation. It's not this stupid story about a guy, you know, who's wandering around the Aegean for a decade because he can't find his way home. This, this, this is our, you know, our nostos, our homecoming. Yeah. This, is, this is our confrontation with not just death, but the, the, the mystery of being that mm -hmm. is at the very center of our being. Um, and uh, I mean, agreed, it wasn't until I read Joseph Campbell that I started you know, rethinking my 13 years of Catholic school yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and then reading about how the Gnostics had the same idea that Jesus wasn't this external figure, but a guide on the path towards salvation, that to become one with Jesus is the whole point. It's there in the Gospels. You don't mm -hmm. need to read all this esoteric stuff. It's right there in the Gospels, uh, in the Gospel of John, about drinking his blood to become him. But, you know, we forget what, all, what that all means. Yeah, the you bring up the gospel of John as sort of a, a special book in this context of, of the Bible. And you talk about the Gnostics. Who, who were the Gnostics? What, what is that? So uh, from Gnoa, from the Greek meaning to, to know, um, the Gnostics, uh, I always quote, the, the best definition is from Elaine Pagels at Princeton, who was writing about the, this movement in, in the late 70s. Um, you know, there's this whole corpus of extra biblical books that were never included into the New Testament, at least the canonical New Testament that came down to us. Uh, there are these other books called the, the Nag Hammadi Corpus that's dug up in Egypt by accident in the 1940s. And here is this whole new version of Jesus. Uh, and these other books, these new gospels, by the way, the gospel of Thomas, for example, the gospel of Judas. Mm -hmm. And they, they, they tell a little bit of a different story about this, about this Jesus. You know, so, some of it's the same and some of it's quite different like in the Gospel of Thomas. Uh, again, Jesus is presented as not someone to be worshiped 
or this external, you know, paternal figure, but someone to be communed with, uh, a friend on the path to, to salvation. And so the Gnostics were this heretical group of Christians, I, I'd say largely like in the second and third centuries AD, um, in the same way that the pagan mysteries disappear, the Gnostic mysteries also disappear in the fourth century AD as the church is getting more powerful and more bureaucratic and, you know, church. doing the Catholic church doing its, which was the only church, uh, well, you know, the church in Rome, mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, um, uh, developing what became mainstream Christianity in the wake of Constantine in the early fourth century. And so they're there for a while and then they disappear, but, you know, they stand for the proposition that there was never one agreement on who Jesus was, mm -hmm. what the Eucharist uh, should be, you know, spiked or not, and what it meant to achieve salvation in this lifetime. So one thing we haven't talked about yet maybe before we, we continue, is your background. So you're obviously very linguistically gifted. What, what was your education like and how, how did that set you up to be in a pretty unique position to, to put together a story like this? Uh, uh, okay, so by complete accident, I wind up at a, at a Jesuit prep school when I'm 14. Now, I couldn't afford to go there, but I got this scholarship from the Jesuits where Latin was mandatory, I think for three years or maybe the whole time. And then Greek was an elective. I wound up taking both. Mm -hmm. And by the end of it had something close to like, a, I mean, a college education in, in classics and went on uh, to Brown to continue Latin and Greek and picked up Sanskrit and Arabic and you know some, some romance languages in the meantime. But I mean, from the very beginning, I was just, you know, languages came to me, I suck at math. You know, so I, I can't I can't even do my taxes. But uh, so but languages always came easy. And, you know, you read enough Greek and you will eventually ask yourself the question I asked myself, like, and it wasn't even at first. Um, it, at some point you're reading Homer or Plato and then you're mm -hmm. reading the New Testament and you realize this is the same language. Like, why? Yeah, yeah. Why do classicists not study the New Testament and why do seminarians not study Homer? I mean, not, not to say that they don't. But if they do, it's not really done in this multidisciplinary way. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, your theology department is separate from classics, by the way, um, yeah. at, at every university I can I can think of. Uh, but I was I wondered if you what if you combine them and what if you started reading the Gospels with that ancient Greek lens um, and thinking about wine, for example, and the Eucharist the way that a Greek would have thought about it in the first or second century A.D. And all these obvious questions start to bubble up, like. What kind of wine was it? I mean, it's it's like it's a yeah. stupidly simple question, <laughs> and the most obvious question. I mean, all this wine, all this wine being served every Sunday on every continent yeah, for hundreds yeah. of millions of Christian faithful. Um, you know, why don't we stop and ask what kind of wine was that? And the minute you start looking into that world, that very Hellenic world, you'll see all the things that we're talking about. Yeah, it was amazing how simple a lot of the stuff seemed, at least in retrospect, as I was reading the book. Because, you know, again, growing up, you know, you, you, go to, you go to mass on Sunday and you drink the wine, the quote unquote blood, and, you know, you eat the tasteless wafer. And you really, I mean, you really make it clear that, you know, when you look at the evidence and we look at the way that people were talking about this type of stuff the whole time, um, it wasn't all just a metaphor. It wasn't all just a placebo. There were quote unquote, real Eucharists that had active ingredients in them. Mm. So I, I just thought that was a really, uh, it was a really interesting twist on stuff I'd already been exposed to in the past, but, it, and it seems so obvious once I got, you know, halfway through the book. Well, here's another obvious one. Again, just a play on language, since you mentioned languages. I mean, so, so wine, what I was referring to is that wine across uh, Greco-Roman antiquity, at least in the Greek language, is referred to as a pharmakon, which mm -hmm. as you can hear from the word is where we get pharmacy. It means drug. Like yeah. one of their words for wine, I mean, the, the common word was oinos, uh, but one of their words for wine from Homer all the way to the fall of the Roman Empire uh, is pharmakon, is a drug. That was their word for, mm -hmm. because it was so routinely mixed yeah. with medicine and all these other magical substances that to call it a pharmakon was not crazy to them. So in the early second century, when Ignatius of Antioch is writing a letter to the Christian uh, Ephesians, he refers to the Eucharist, if you remember from the book, as the pharmakon Athanasias, which is the, the title of one of my favorite chapters, the drug of immortality. Mm -hmm. Now, is that just a happy play on words? Or are we talking about, <laughs> right, you know, right. is, something, is something else going on here? Yeah. Um, 
Okay, so why don't we go through, I would love to go through the story of um, some of the things that you uncovered with respect to wine and the things that were being mixed into it. And maybe that will sort of be a natural lead in to what you described as the original war on drugs. So, so what did you find with respect to wine? Let's dwell on that for a while. And then let's, let's let everyone know the story about how and why a lot of the stuff was um, actively suppressed for so long. Okay, so the, the the quick history of wine is that I, I don't think we have the um, the material evidence that it's quite as old as beer. In the book, I talk about um, you know potential finds of beer fermentation as far back as twelve, thirteen thousand years ago in the Epipaleolithic, when we go from hunting and gathering mm-hmm. to settled life. So uh, because we have early it goes in- at least that far back. At least, exactly. Yeah. That, that's that's what the, the early indicia is that it's 12, 13,000 years. For some reason, unless I'm mistaken, that wine doesn't go quite that far back, at least the, the Eurasian evidence that we mm-hmm. found. Uh, what, what I was seeing was more like 6,000 BC in Georgia, not too long after that at the Haji Firuz Tepe site um, in modern day Iran. Um, uh, Pat McGovern found a wine that was spiked with terebinth. So again, one of these things that would preserve the wine and prevent it from spoiling uh, into, into vinegar basically. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, fast forward, there was another interesting wine find um, from the, the tomb of Scorpion the first, roughly 3150 BC in Egypt. Just like the Tel Kabri wine from, you know, a bit later, 1700 BC, it's wine that's routinely spiked mm-hmm. uh, with all kinds of funky plants and herbs. Uh, and then, so fast forward all the way to the first century uh, AD, and at the same time that that, that manuscript from Dioscorides is being written, his Materia Medica, that talks about all of these plants and spiked wines. Um, I, you know, I was digging through these archaeobotany journals looking for something like the ergotized beer. And weirdly, at the exact same time, more or less, uh, published in the year 2000, was this other, you know, underreported discovery of uh, a really funky wine uh, from outside Pompeii which is also interesting because it's the part of Italy that was calling to the earliest Christians um, in Magna Graecia, which was Great Greece. So another, you know, territory just um, uh, rife with with the Greek mystery cults. And what they what they found there in the late 90s was wine that seemingly had been spiked because they found Mm -hmm. the seeds seemingly spiked with opium, cannabis, henbane and black nightshade. I mean, so, you know, fairly psychoactive Mm -hmm. at the right doses, visionary material. And, you know, what the hell is it doing there? Um, It's, it's, I mean, it shouldn't be a surprise based on what I just said about the wine, you know, being spiked in Egypt and, and Galilee. And before that in Iran, I mean, this was a hotbed of experimentation. It makes perfect sense to find a wine like that, but it's, it's, you know, it's really the, the first, again, hard scientific data from classical antiquity that I've ever found mm-hmm. for one of these really complex visionary wines. So as we go forward in time, you know, there's, there's a lot in the book around um, witches. So this is another area where I got re-educated. So my only notion of witchcraft and witches before reading this book was just, you know, the standard stereotype of a witch, an old lady in the woods, mixes stuff together in a cauldron, flying brooms, Halloween, that I never really looked at it the way that I now look at it, which is, <laughs> you know, these, these were people in this case, women who had botanical knowledge that was extensive and they knew how to mix things together. I didn't know that they were mixing literal potions in the ways that you get into. They were making topicals. They were making, you know, a variety of products for lack of a better term, where they were consciously brewed and constructed to have, in some cases, psychoactive effects. So can you maybe tell the story of of witchcraft and and what was going on at the time that the Catholic Church is really starting to rise and really persecute the people that were doing these types of things and, and why they were doing that? Yeah, it's that nefarious combination of women and drugs that I call the the, the constant thorn in the side of the Catholic Church. For, for a long time, um, they were, they, the witches, were relatively uncontroversial. Uh, I say in the book that, you know, the, the, the church certainly had its hands full with the Crusades mm-hmm. and other, and, you know, and, and other endeavors in Europe. But then by about the 14th, 15th centuries, uh, the witches are, are becoming a problem. 
um, and specifically in Italy. And during the Inquisition, it would eventually result in, you know, the, even the most conservative estimates are something like 90,000 prosecutions and 45,000 executions. The figure is probably much higher than that. Um, and I quote a figure that at some point, even one woman being um, targeted like that in any given community would have had this, 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 you know, this net effect to generally, um, you know, lay on the conscience of millions of people. I mean, this, the, the, the Inquisition uh, had a big effect in the early modern period, and not least of which was because of women and their knowledge of these herbs. This is, mm -hmm. this is the, the classic witch, and this is where we get the idea of them riding on broomsticks. And so I, I owe a lot of what I write to these, these great historians, Carlo Ginsberg among them, and my friend Tom Hatzis writes about the witch's ointment, which if you look into the, the botany of the witch's ointment is a really another you know, funky concoction. Uh, in fact, the Pope's personal physician, Andres Laguna, in 1554, uh, he actually lists out the ingredients that he thought spiked the famous unguento, the witch's ointment. And he talks about the same kinds of things that I was seeing in that farmhouse, in that pharmacy in uh, outside Pompeii, things like henbane and mm -hmm. black nightshade. And he also mm -hmm. mentions mandrake uh, and hemlock. The idea that these went into this green ointment that allowed women the, the power of flight. Um, and that, you know, we think through some kind of lore that they would smear this onto the broomstick, uh, wedge it between their legs and thereby absorb these toxic alkaloids to give them the sensation of flight. It's just, it's really fantastic stuff. What do we know um, about the chemistry there? What, what kind of compounds are in plants like hembane and what might they do? That's a great question. So the, these are, and I get this, I've, uh, I get this question a lot too, because they're not, they're not the classical psychedelics, right? I mean, you're thinking, right, exactly. so they're, they're not the, you, you want to think about like the ergolines, like LSD, you want to think about the tryptamines. Yep. So these like, are not classical serotonin stimulating psychedelics. Yeah. That's right. These are, in fact, these are, I think they're classified as delirians. These, yeah. these, you know, these are not fun experiences. These are largely tropane alkaloids uh, like atropine and scopolamine, uh, which mm -hmm. is sometimes referred to as the devil's breath, all this, all this fun stuff. I mean, the nightshades. Yeah. I mean, again, you really need to know what you're doing yep. when it comes yep. to tropane alkaloids. So again, the fact that these are being mixed into a wine in the first century AD or being mixed into some kind of unguent in the 15th or, or 16th centuries is really, I mean, it's really mind boggling. Yeah. They had to know. You can't do it haphazardly. Doing. Yeah. No, they, they can't. And, and even um, as, as a quick footnote, a couple weeks ago, uh, there was this paper released about um, similar tropane alkaloids, which you can find in Datura, that yep. were wedged into the walls of this cave, the pinwheel cave in California. Yeah, I read that. Um, only about 400 years ago that, that that was dated, but it's the very first archaeochemical evidence for the presence of psychedelics uh, and their association with rock and cave art. You know, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's an old other controversial theory, like the theory about um, the classical antiquity. But again, we, we are now seeing the hard scientific evidence that people knew what they were doing yeah. with really, really dangerous material. Yeah. And when I read that, I mean, I was fascinated by that study on the pinwheel cave. And again, it was 400 years ago. So it's a completely different time period from the story we're focused on here. But anywhere you look in history, it seems people had an understanding of the psychoactive properties of many of indirectly of many of the compounds that are in the local plant life and they have deep enough knowledge to know that it's there and to apparently dose it properly so that you don't die. I mean, that, that, that I still can't explain. Um, th this notion that, that, that posology is the secret to pharmacology, that mm -hmm. if you don't know your dose, that you have no, you have no business messing with plants, but they had no choice. Yeah. Right. I mean, across antiquity, there was no difference between cuisine and pharmacology. It's how they got their medicine. It's how they made their cosmetics. Uh, it's how they got their nutrition. It's how they worship their wine gods. I mean, the, the, they were much, you know, much closer to nature than we are today. Uh, you know, yeah. I go to the, I go to the food market. They went to the garden and and picked out uh, picked out their magical sources. Yeah, it made me think about um, a couple things. So, I mean, you can look anywhere else. I think a good example is you know in the Amazon ayahuasca, which is mm -hmm. it's not just a drug. It's actually two drugs, and one of them only works in the presence of the other one orally. So the the depth of knowledge required to figure that out again, it, it had to have 
in my view, it, it had to have been through some sort of systematic experimentation on different combinations of local plant life to, to eventually figure out how to do that. And then, you know, fast forward to today and my industry, legal cannabis industry, in a weird way, it's almost like we're, we're coming back to this way of, of doing things. We're trying to figure out how to extract the right proportion of compounds from cannabis and other plants to make elixirs, to make literal tinctures, to make topicals. And, and in many ways, we're just, we're just going back to what people were doing for thousands of years. Yeah, in many ways, we're just trying to catch up. Yeah, uh, and and it sounds silly and cliche this notion of forgotten wisdom, but how the hell someone figured out how to combine Banisteriopsis copy with <laughs> Cipotria viridis to induce this experience that would be long lasting and life changing um, in ayahuasca, for example, is crazy to me. Or the fact that that many 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 variations, many admixtures of ayahuasca exist. Yep. in the Amazon basin uh, is even more amazing to me. Uh, so yeah, in many ways, we're just, we're just catching up. So we, we touched on your educational background and, and your, your knack for languages. That was obviously something you seemed passionate about from the beginning, and it probably drove in many ways your passion for a project like this. So the other thing is, well, I can say from my own experience and many, many people that you can point to you know, online or from my own life, and the whole reason I really went into science in general and neuroscience in particular and have continued to be fascinated by that area of study was from my own experiences with psychedelics like psilocybin and like DMT. Mm. And, you know, in reading this book, it's a very natural thought for the reader to have that mm -hmm. maybe that was also a driving force for you. So have, have you experienced um, any psychedelics and and what role did that play in actually driving you here so i'm 100 percent a psychedelic virgin <laughs> uh and you know I, I approach the book consciously with that in mind i'm still a virgin and i probably will be for a while um because i i you know if you want to read a book about a white guy who does psychedelics and finds God. There's a really wonderful bibliography out there. Uh, and so you know, not only to do something new, uh, but something uh, that could engage people for whom psychedelics is still a taboo subject. Yeah. And these conversations, uh, you know, I'm trying to curate uh, with, with colleagues in academia. Uh, it was important for me just to see where the data is, you know, and, you know, just being true to the data in, in the psychopharmacology and being true to the data in archaeobotany and archaeochemistry, I mean, that, that, that's enough for me uh, mm -hmm. for, for now. It was enough to keep me interested. Um, so, you know, I think it's, maybe it's insincere that, uh, that I put it off for so long, but it's, it's something in my future. It's definitely coming, but, you know, I, have, I, I can just, you know, I can ride your experiences, Nick. You can just tell me all about it. <laughs> well, I mean, the first thing that someone will tell you there is, you know, you can't, you can put words to this stuff to some extent, but, you know, you can't download the experience into someone else just by talking about it. Words really... Really, it really goes beyond words. I mean that both figuratively and literally, you know, on a high dose of psychedelics, you are clearly in a different brain state. The patterns of activity in your brain are very different from the ones you observe in normal waking consciousness. And in many cases, your linguistic faculties literally break down. So in a very literal, literal sense, um, a lot of the phenomenality that one experiences on something like DMT or a high dose of, of psilocybin is, you know, it's un, unspeakable, literally. Mm. Um, but nonetheless, everyone that has those experiences, I mean, pretty much without fail, is deeply moved by them in some way and almost always for the better, even when they are difficult experiences. And speaking from my own experience and then, you know, tying it to something you just said, um, and, and that you really go into a lot in the book is, you know, whether it's the Eleusinian mysteries or, or any of these other experiences that people were having, they were not, they were not haphazard experiences. They were curated experiences. People who had expertise in how to make these potions, people who had extensive experience in these in ingesting these things were curating the experience for other individuals. And, I think that's that appears to be where we're moving today. If you look at a lot of the research that's being done in psychedelics, mm. there's a lot of work 
not just to study them and their mechanisms of action and, and the clinical trials that are going on, but combining them with psychotherapy in a very curated way where people are mm. guided through an experience. And that seems to be a key component to, to all of these activities. Yeah. And I, and I hope it stays that way. I mean, I, I don't think anyone expects you're going to get a prescription for psilocybin and go home just walk out. <laughs> and just walk, you know, walk out the door and go home and have a great Friday night. I think that, you know, it's, it's important um, from a therapeutic perspective that it's not just the substance, right? Obviously we know, we all know about the famous set and setting. Um, but, but I think that what you're seeing in the clinical trials is, is exactly that is establishing the trust with the people who are there with you going through what could be a harrowing experience for some people yeah. who haven't been properly screened or properly prepared. Uh, this is not for everybody. Part of the reason I haven't done it yet is just, you know, this, this really isn't for everybody. Mm -hmm. um, and, and not everybody who takes psychedelics walks away a spiritual savant. Some of them walk away like Charles Manson. Uh, you yeah. know, so it's, it's, it's how it's done, with the intention with which it's done, that's obviously hugely important in these clinical trials and why they get such great outcomes, whether for depression, anxiety, or end of life distress, it's because of how it's done um, in this very methodological way. And I, I would hope that when this does become legal uh, in the next five years or so, when the FDA has approved this stuff, that there are licensed uh, you know, centers out there, like we're probably going to see in Oregon in yep. two years. I mean, that's clearly going to be a model for the rest of the country and will um, you know, pretty, uh, pretty easily rewrite the mental health care industry. Uh, it's, everything is going to change over the next few years. And as long as we maintain standards, I think it's a very, a very powerful thing. What happens beyond that in the realm of religion and for so society at large? I'm not quite sure yet. Yeah, there is, um, there's this wonderful quote you have in the beginning. You just mentioned what will happen in the realm of religion and how that will mm -hmm. interact with this whole psychedelic renaissance that's happening. Um, there's this great Huxley quote from the beginning. I think I have it here where he says, quote, my own belief is that though they may start by being something of an embarrassment, these new mind changers will tend in the long run to deepen the spiritual life of the communities in which they are available. The famous revival of religion about which so many people have been talking for so long will not come about as the result of evangelistic mass meetings or the television appearances of photogenic clergymen. It will come about as the result of biochemical discoveries. Uh, I just thought that was a really cool quote. Um, what, why did you put that in the beginning from Huxley? And what, talk a little bit about Huxley and what was going on at that time before we sort of went into the psychedelic dark ages again that we're just emerging from. Yeah, you and I and, and probably most of your listeners got the short end of the stick with the war on drugs. Um, and again, not that I don't I really don't do drugs, but just, a, you know, as a as, as a as a matter of cognitive liberty, uh, it's mm -hmm. just it's really it's really strange. The era that we were born into post post Nixon and not normal and an extraordinary exactly. waste of, of resources. Uh, if it's one thing that doesn't belong in the criminal justice system, it is drugs. Uh, mm -hmm. that, does not, that doesn't cure your addiction. If you are addicted, if you're unfortunate to be addicted to drugs, going to jail is not the, the, the best way of kicking your habit. Uh, so we got, we got that all wrong, obviously. And it, it's, it's coming to an end in Oregon and elsewhere. Uh, cannabis uh, uh, on, mm -hmm. on the international level was just descheduled. Uh, which is really interesting. So um, before that, you had folks like Huxley and Alan Watts and Houston Smith, perhaps the greatest religious scholar of the 20th century, doing LSD and psilocybin and mescaline and having profound experiences and being able to talk about it yeah. like a bunch of scholarly gentlemen. And you know, the, the quote you just read was written in 1958. Um, I mean, it's just, it, it's incredible. And is, is it possible that after, when, when the fog of war finally lifts, uh, is it possible that we can read Huxley's words and think about a responsible way to incorporate this biotechnology into some sense of whatever religion becomes in the 21st century? I mean, I, I don't know. I would love to think that it's possible. Not every Sunday. We're not, we're not dosing the communion wine. But, you know, in the same way, Eleusis was a once-in-a-lifetime experience. In the mm -hmm. same way that Dinah Baser, one of the volunteers in the NYU psilocybin experiments, talks about her one and only dose of psilocybin, being like being bathed in God's love. Is it possible that under the right curated conditions, uh, we can envision the, these biotechnologies enhancing faith, 
or re-enchanting a generation uh, and introducing them to the concept of, of a spiritually led life for the very first time. Um, I mean, this is how religions grow, by the way. It doesn't happen. Yeah you know, overnight, and it doesn't happen like as just abstract theories. Whatever was happening 2,000 years ago to the Greeks and early Christians was something visceral and profound that convinced them they had found the essence of life, which is clearly missing today. Yeah, I mean, one of the um, one of the things that's undeniable about psychedelics, and I think, you know, part of their power and, and, and the, the real impact that they can have over people is you know, unlike other methods of spirituality, you know, if you want to call it that, you know, you don't have to believe anything. You don't have to meditate in a cave for 12 years to get to the state that you might get to if you do that meditation for 12 years. You don't have to sweep the ashram for for 10 years. You don't have to learn Greek and, you know, read, you know, the entire corpus of literature um, you don't have to undertake those gargantuan efforts to see that certain states of consciousness are possible. If you take the right dose of LSD or you take the right dose of psilocybin or you take the right dose of DMT, you are going to have an experience that's very, very different from normal waking consciousness. And it, you can definitely see why people often talk about these things in spiritual or even religious terms. And it's very interesting to think about the way you know, if more people start having experience with psychedelics, the interactions that we'll have and the way that will cause um, religious practices to evolve. And so in thinking about the, the interaction between organized religion and psychedelics, where, where do you think that could go? And maybe we can get there by first describing uh, a little bit more on what actually happened in the other direction with the Catholic Church. So they really started making some heavy, heavy, and frankly, violent efforts for, I think, hundreds or thousands of years to really stamp this stuff out. So how did that end up playing out? And what was, what was the, the threat to the church as they perceived it? It's hard to tell. And, and I think there, there were probably several threats. And I think I'm on the record saying that I even sympathize with the church fathers uh, because I can, I can understand the need to nation build at a time in the fourth century AD when there isn't much separation between church and state, mm -hmm. um, you know, their, their priority was nation building and developing some kind of orthodoxy that people could get behind, you know, these secret rites and, 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 and magical sacraments don't lend themselves well to organize religion. In fact, it, it's the whole point. Um, you know, these, these are, these are secrets that are, that yeah. are passed from generation to generation. Um, so I, part of me understands the need to curate some kind of organization, right? And, and what happens with any organization is that the, the original, the founding vision tends to become diluted over time. I, mm -hmm. I, I quote the Benedictine monk, uh, David Steindl Rasht at the, in the intro of my book, who talks about this, this, this conflict, this tension, this, this constant tension between bureaucracy and mysticism, is that cl clearly th these religions are born on visionary experiences. Judaism, Christianity, Islam, it's, it's all baked into the, the, the foundation myths of, of where they come from. Uh, and, and at some point, you know, uh, the Brother David says, uh, the pipes get rusty and begin to leak. And that, and that, that flow from the original source slows down to a trickle. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the, the goal is to try and reinvigorate that, to always keep that alive, to keep that mystic sense alive. Not to say there's no need for organizational structure or even doctrine and dogma, but the idea that, that God, as Joseph Campbell would say, is an experience to be lived. That what we're not looking for is a meaning of life, but an experience of being alive. Alive. Um, I mean, isn't there a way that we can curate that experience and still have respect for institutions or, or the history upon which these institutions were founded? Um, I think we got it wrong over the course of Christianity, and you see the saints and mystics and visionaries uh, under constant suspicion and oftentimes persecution because a direct pipeline to God is, a, you know, is kind of seen as a threat. The yeah, it obviates structure. the need for a middleman, which is really what the church is. Um, which is what it what it, which is what it becomes under some under some circumstances, uh, okay. and 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 doesn't have to be uh, yeah. because again, you can look around the world today and, and see thirty three thousand denominations of Christianity, mm -hmm. and some of it is quite intense, 
And some of it is very relies very intensely on direct experience, like the Pentecostal churches mm -hmm. in North America or the Santo Daime who in Brazil who use a psychedelic sacrament. Uh, you know, same today as, as 2000 years ago. I don't think there was ever one definition over what this thing could be and, and how it perceived the threats to, mm -hmm. to its survival. Uh, and, and I think that you see this religion with no name winding its way um, all over the history of Christianity and Western civilization. It's still here today, and it looks like it's reemerging in Oregon uh, under, under a different guise, and it will continue evolving um, across this decade. So what, um, you know, if you, if you could have the right curated experience under the right conditions, what would that look like? What, what would the compound be, and, and how do you imagine that actually happening? Me and Nick would head into the forest... <laughs> We would throw our cell phones into the river. No, I'm just, <laughs> well, I can. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. I, I can. I mean, I, I don't. I'm not. Sure, I'm not quite sure how how it looks. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm often asked, like, if if I'm trying to really like recreate the ancient sacrament. And part of me, of course, is. Yeah. I'm, I'm just. I'm dying to know yeah. what that original kukian was. I'm dying to know. And I'm dying to know what that. Uh, that spiked wine from Pompeii looked and tasted and felt like. I mean, I'm dying to know. Mm -hmm. And I think that's important. But it's also important not to overlook the obvious that we have these substances today. And yeah. the, the, the amount of rigorous work that's been done on psilocybin mm -hmm. is enough to convince a skeptic like me that under the right conditions, it can be both safe and efficacious and lead to these profound transformative experiences. So my, you know, subject to further analysis, my, my sacrament of choice at the moment would probably be psilocybin both with a trained therapeutic guide mm -hmm. and, and also with some kind of um, spiritual professional yeah. uh, or religious professional. Um, and I'm not sure that that doesn't exist yet. There's no legal um, domain to do that that I know of today. Yep. Um, maybe in Jamaica. Not in the uh, U.S., yeah. yeah not, certainly not in the U.S. And so, but it's coming soon. It's coming. So, yeah. Yeah, and I think, um, I think we'll actually be there faster than even I would have thought a year ago, I think. Um, I think we really are making progress on that front. And, and psilocybin is, it, it is fascinating. I mean, both scientifically, when you look at what we're learning about it and the brain states it induces and how that correlates with the phenomenology, but also in my own experience, you know, my first psilocybin experience when I was like 17, like absolutely changed me forever. That was uh, yeah. truly like a step change for me. I, I ended up on my own, which I do not recommend for most people's first time, although I think that was a key ingredient for mine. I ended up, you know, at the time I was, you know, a skinny kid who took probably more than I thought I was taking. And with mushrooms, part of the reason why legalization or at least decriminalization is so important is controlling purity and dosage. So I took quite a large dose, ended up by myself in my own bed at home um, as the sun was setting. And long story short, I had a very profound experience. I completely, I had an ego dissolution experience. Not even, I didn't, I had never had that experience before. And I had no conceptual framework at that age that something like that was possible. Um, but looking back, you know, you could immediately see how that type of experience for anyone in ancient times or present is just going to immediately change your perspective on life and, and the types of experiences that are possible and the value of just being able to experience it all. I think one of the things I did want to mention to you is in, in many ways, I'm, I guess I'm like the inverse of you. So we're both interested in a lot of this stuff. My training is very different from your training. Uh, I come from a hard science background and I don't come with a lot of linguistic gifts and, and the education that you had. And I am not a psychedelic virgin. I'm the exact opposite of that. One, one thing that I think is fascinating is you know, my trajectory there was early on, I, I experienced psilocybin. I experienced salvia divinorum. I experienced then LSD, each of these things multiple times. Um, I experienced uh, NNDMT later on, but many times. And then one time I experienced 5-MeO-DMT in a very controlled and curated setting with a very controlled dose that was very pure. And, you know, I can talk all day long about my other experiences, but that 5-MeO experience stands out to me as probably the most profound one of all and immediately coming out of that. So wow. I took, 
I, I took two inhalations, so two doses back to back. So you, you did the one dose and then you had the option of doing the second one. And I and everyone else who did it took that took that option. So I'll put it that way. Um, my eyes were closed on the first one. And I was told at the beginning by the person administering it that um, it was talked about in, in more of an Eastern framework, more of a Buddhist framework. So we were told point blank in a very confident language, this is going to put you in a state of samadhi consciousness. You're not going to have any percepts at all. You're going to, you're going to reach a state that, you know, yogis get after 20 years of meditation, um, et cetera, et cetera. And, and I was also told that I would reactivate so that in the days following it, I would relive the experience to some extent, probably at night. And going into that, you know, I was sitting there as a neuroscientist and as someone who had tried everything else. And I said, mm, that sounds like bullshit. Mm. Um, I've never, there's no acid flashbacks. That doesn't happen. Um, I appreciated, but didn't maybe appreciate as much as I would the, the, the way it was described in, in Eastern terms. Um, so I immediately came out of the first dose with my eyes closed and there's nothing to report because again, there was no, there was no content to it. It was contentless. Um, it was just void. Um, but as you come out of it back to normal consciousness, you have this very, very deep and visceral sensation of bliss. Like even though there was nothing to report on, I didn't see anything. There was no, there was no visuals. Literally, I just come out of it with this complete state of bliss and and restfulness in my mind, and I immediately signal with my hands that I want to try the second dose. Like immediately, as soon as I was physically able to do that, I said yes. Let me try that again. And I didn't plan to leave my eyes open the second time, but they were. And I was looking up at a light. And so, in contrast to the first experience, which was void of content and complete darkness, this one was the bright white light. You know, in retrospect, as soon as I came out of it and I could think again, I was like, okay, that is every near-death experience and every, you know, every classic description of that type of thing. You know, my life flashed, be flashed before my eyes just before I got into a car accident or just before I went into cardiac arrest. Um, every, you know, if you hear people talk about a very high dose LSD experience, I think that's the, the brain state you get to probably with a high dose of a lot of these substances, but for 5-MeO, mm. it, it put you there immediately and to an extent that I had not experienced with any other psychedelic before. And I don't have any concrete evidence for this, but phenomenologically, when I look back at a lot of the things that you talk about in your book and a lot of the ways they're described, 5-MeO is the compound that really jumps, jumps to the front of the list for me. I was very interested to see if you would find evidence of any 5-MeO usage in the book, and, you know, there's evidence historically, I think, from toads and other things that, that maybe, maybe it somehow got into some of these concoctions, but um, is probably harder to come by. Wow. I mean, that's a, first of all, that, that's a phenomenal story. I feel like I have nothing of value to add from here on out. Uh, I could just listen to, to stories like that all day, which is a, part of the reason I wrote the book. I love listening to stories like that because, you know, what you're describing I mean, is it fair to say that you would consider that a mystical experience? Yeah. I mean, again, I'm not a religious person and there's no need to to bundle these experiences together with, you know, overt religiosity, um, if, if that's not your cup of tea. But yes, I would. So as a non-religious person, I think anyone that would describe themselves as religious or spiritual would certainly interpret this type of experience in that way. And even if you're not like me, like I... I think it's fair to call it a mystical or spiritual experience because it, you know, it fundamentally alters your state of consciousness. You have no, your ego does die, quote unquote. It obviously comes back. It's reborn, um, as they say, but it puts you into a state that makes you appreciate the ability to just be aware at all much more. Mm. And don't get me wrong. As I was coming out of the 5MEO experience, I did have, you know, absolutely crazy and beautiful, colorful forms. I immediately, as I was coming out of it as well, thought about people like Plato and the theory of <laughs> forms. And I had, the, I had the notion in my mind, like, oh, like maybe, 
you know, my mind went there. I was like, maybe some of those early thinkers describing things like that had something akin to this. This is, of course, before I read your book, so it, it kind of made me dwell on that even more. Mm. But, but yes, I would call it a, a mystical experience. You know, even Roland Griffiths at Johns Hopkins, he's a straight-laced and rigorous a scientist as you're going to find. You know, he talks about the mystical type experience, and he, he talks about it purely in academic and and frankly, quantifiable terms, as you can. So, so again, these th- these experiences are powerful. You can describe them as mystical, but I want to make it also clear that 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 doesn't necessarily need to come bundled with, you know, metaphysical claims that are beyond what science can describe. So then, I only have one follow up question, which is because now I'm fascinated, given given your background. Um, you know, it, I, I I agree. We get lost in in the in the in the jargon. So do you have different, I mean, with all these experiences, maybe perhaps, Mm -hmm. you know, climaxing in five MEO DMT, do you think differently about life and death? Do you have, maybe it's too personal. Do you have an intuition about what, if anything happens when your physical body dies, that that is informed by these experiences? Yes. Um, I think the short answer is yes. The way that I think about that as a scientist, as a neuroscientist in particular is, so let's describe a little bit of what we know about the brain states that one can measure when people take something like psilocybin or a classical psychedelic. Then I'll back into the phenomenology that I described and what I think might happen under a quote unquote natural death. And when I say natural death, I mean, you're old, you're lying in bed, you're, you're, not, getting hit, you're not getting hit by a truck. You are slowly <laughs> right. shutting down due to your body being decrepit. So what do we know about the brain states of psychedelics? Well, basically, and this was surprising to a lot of people when it started to be observed, um, you might naturally think, oh, with all the pyrotechnics and hallucinations that you get, there must be all kinds of extra activity happening in the brain. And to some extent, there might be. Um, But a lot of what you observe from EEG recordings and fMRI data, at least in the cortex, the outer wrinkles of the brain, is that things often get quieter so the, the, the brain is literally becoming quieter. There's less chatter, it seems, in the cerebral cortex. And when you start to think about it from, you know, maybe an Eastern perspective, you know, a meditation master, um, and when you start to actually look at the data on meditation and neuroscience, the brain states that you see from people in a deep state of meditation are, at least on a high level, not unlike the brain states you observe when people are given fairly large doses of psilocybin. So your brain is getting quieter in many ways. And then, you know, when you think about how people talk about these things, you know, the doors, the doors of perception being cleansed, um, you know, the, the samadhi states of consciousness that are devoid of differentiated perceptions that you hear about in the Eastern religion, et cetera, et cetera, it starts to make a hell of a lot of sense. Your brain is literally getting quieter. That includes especially the regions of the brain that we know are important for your conception of self, your ego, your ability to introspect. So phenomenologically, people experience these states of ego death, and that sounds a little airy-fairy until you experience it yourself. But neurologically, we see exactly, um, we see a pretty good correspondence to the brain states that, that you know, that, that jives with that. Mm-hmm. So going back to fi- my 5-MEO description, phenomenologically, it was very much, I've never had a near-death experience, but as soon as I had that experience, I was like, okay, this is, this seems to be exactly what that is. Like, mm. I see the light, everything is blissful, I have this sort of pure, undifferentiated perception, and I come out of it with this very pro- profound and, and powerful appreciation for being alive at all. Mm-hmm. So what do I think is going on there? Well, I think these compounds are literally quieting down your brain. They're obviously quieting down parts of your brain that do complex things like linguistic thought, perception, et cetera, et cetera. They're clearly not shutting down the rest of your brain, which is good because you survive these experiences. So your brainstem circuitry that's responsible for keeping your heart beating and your lungs filled with air is still going. And that makes a lot of sense because, you know, the more complex cognitive functions of the brain are more expensive, right? That's why they're relatively unique to humans. Mm. Um, And that's why those things probably shut down first. So Mm. if you start to think about a natural death experience, you know, think by analogy to walking outside in the wintertime. 
with no coat and, and no gloves, your fingertips are going to get cold and your toes are going to get cold and numb way before other parts of your body because, you know, we've evolved to have these built-in robustness mechanisms, meaning that your, your body knows keep the heat on your vital organs and shut heat off from the other areas first. Because if you lose a couple of fingers, that's unfortunate, but you'll survive. But if your heart stops beating or your lung stops breathing or your brain shuts off, then the whole, the whole body is over. Mm -hmm. So there's an order of operations. The things that are absolutely essential are maintained and, and shut off last. So when you think about a natural death, an old person on their deathbed, and you think about you know everything's sort of slowly shutting down, your, right, your kidneys are going to shut off before your heart, right? Mm -hmm. And in your brain, there must also, I would, I would expect, be an order of operations. The very metabolically expensive and sophisticated neural networks in your cortex that allow you to speak and do calculus and you know, logically reason are going to shut off before the circuits that are responsible for low-level perception and breathing and vital functions. Mm -hmm. And so I think in a near-death experience or an actual death experience, as those higher order brain areas shut off, but the other ones are still online, you have this quieter brain, you have a lack of normal perception of the ego and subject object distinctions and so forth, but you still have a certain level of quote unquote, pure conscious awareness. And I think psychedelics and meditation practices and things like this simply put you in a state that is not unlike that. Hmm. So that's what I think is going on. And so I think, you know, coming out of those experiences for me, I, I now know or I appreciate more that when it does come time for my own brain to shut off permanently, um, I know that that can and will be one of the most blissful and important experiences of my life. And in, in those seconds or minutes in between having a fully aware and differentiated state of consciousness and death, you will be in an undifferentiated state meaning you're not having specific perceptions, there is no linguistic thought, and there is no perception of space and time. Hmm. So I'm not saying right, you live forever and there's a place that you go that's really fun to hang out and everyone you knew is there having a great time. But in those moments before you truly expire, there is no sense of time. And while you're in that perception, there's not only no you, there's no center to the experience, but there's also... Uh, it feels like forever. There's so, no not you either. Right. So there is this, it, it's just interesting to think about in that way. And I, I do quite strongly believe based on the neurological data that we have and the phenomenology of these experiences and the way people describe them, that you know when you go into altered states, whether it's with a drug or yoga or whatever, it is I think putting you into a brain state that's not unlike what happens when your body is shutting down. And that's mm. why there is this deep connection between near-death experiences and mortality and spirituality and psychedelics. You would have been quite welcome on the steps of the School of Athens, my friend. <laughs> uh, Plato once wrote that uh, true philosophy is nothing else but the practice of dying and being dead. This, this is why the Greeks were obsessed with thanatology. The thanatology. study of the death and, and dying process. I mean, th this has been a whole conversation about thanatology. Because I mean, what else? What else is there? I mean, how do we forget? You know, when you wake up in the morning, that you will die someday. I think it's something that should be um, meditated upon um, mm -hmm. every single day. Because I think if you do do that, I mean, you having experienced that, me not having experienced that through five meo, but through other experiences. Mm -hmm which is the conversation I rarely have, but, but clearly I've, I've had my own near death experiences, which is why I'm really attracted to, to psychedelics and how they imitate that and how they imitate perhaps the natural dying process to focus on that, to, to study that and to make that the epicenter of your scholarship uh, to me is true ancient philosophy, because I think what it does is it connects you back to the real world. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, without having to preoccupy ourselves with the fear of death or, you know, um, or, or being so, I don't know, scared of it in such a way that we have all these unconscious, uh, you know, anxieties that, that, that arise and all these ways that we distract ourselves in life to ever, you know, to prevent ourselves from thinking about immortality. I think to have a, a healthy relationship with death 
um, puts you in the here and now. And in my case, you know, lets me love my family more, lets me try to be as present as I can and enjoy uh, the little things. Uh, this is what Cicero said about mm -hmm. Lucis, that to, to live with joy and to die with a better hope. It's both. So mm -hmm. it's, it's also having, it's not only having no fear around death, it's also living with joy and living fully present and, and appreciating this, this, this fleeting moment in timelessness that mm -hmm. we seem to be inhabiting. So um, what, if you're comfortable talking about it, what, what kind of experience were you referring to? <laughs> so uh, without getting into details, I, when I was five, I had a, a near death experience. My older brother uh, knocked me in, in the forehead accidentally mm -hmm. with, uh, with, with a golf club um, and had one of those uh, interesting near-death moments, um, moments that I found uh, somewhat replicated in, in intense periods of meditation mm -hmm. when I was uh, a teenager and in my early 20s. I mean, things I wasn't necessarily looking for, um, uh, things I didn't know how to interpret at the time, uh, but not unlike the all the chatter just kind of quieting down it doesn't happen very often uh but when it does it's it's the kind of thing that that you never forget right right um and so without having done psychedelics when i read the literature when i listen to you and you know the hundreds of other stories i've heard over the past decade it's just it's it, it becomes clearer and clearer to me that we're all talking about this same toolkit of archaic techniques and uh, again if that can help us both live with joy and die with with better hope i mean what else is there worth studying in life i i completely agree and i know that we only have a couple minutes left so you know let's say that you know some some wealthy individual or some government agency or potentially the vatican says you know what we we really there's more to be discovered here and and what one thing I loved about your book uh, is you uncovered a lot, but there's still clearly a lot to be discovered. So if if you had the resources and you had the team that you would you know the all star team of archae archaeologists and classicists and so forth, where where would you be looking and what would you be looking for to to continue this? Yeah, I, I do think we've only scratched the surface, and I, I I only present my book as proof of concept, not for the presentation of any smoking guns. It's 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 just to show that some of this data has been overlooked, right? So whether it's the spiked beer or the spiked wine from 20 years ago, I think it it only it only serves the proposition that there are all these chalices and cups and vessels that haven't been tested. So in my mind, I mean, there are dozens and dozens of sites that I want to visit and dig in the dirt. Uh, with Andrew Coe at MIT. Uh, I mean, and the, the 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 sites that I see are, I mean, all over the Holy Land, for example. And anywhere you see the the ancient pagan mysteries bumping up against the Christian mysteries, mm -hmm. are the the kind of thing that really interests me. Um, so you're going to see that in a place like Skithopolis in modern day Israel, where churches are built on top, you know, of, of, of pagan foundations. Or you're going to mm -hmm. find that in Greece or Italy, North Africa, Egypt. I mean, you're going to find it all over. The Mediterranean, um, but you know, I'm interested in everything. Uh, I'm interested in ancient Judaism too. Uh, I'm interested in Islam. I'm interested in the Vedic tradition, and you know, all for the purpose of if this is if this stuff was important to us in the past, uh, should it matter in our present, and what does it mean for the future of um, pharmacology and medicine and religion and society at large? I mean, again, like Huxley said, are we sitting on biotechnology? Mm -hmm. That could change the world, um, not just for therapeutic purposes, uh, but for but for all of us. And how does that, you know, how does that get unveiled over the next decade? I have no idea. But uh, if I had uh, the funding and the Vatican on my side, I'd be a very I'd be a very happy boy the next decade. Well, I think that's a great place to end, Brian. Um, thank you for writing this book. I know you worked on it for something like twelve years. I think it was truly a heroic effort. And like I said, no, no traditional academic could have put something like this together in my view. And I know it's quite successful. You're selling a lot of books. So I'm happy people are reading this. It's a fascinating story. Um, just, just in terms of the writing, um, it's, it's a page turner, you know, kind of reads almost like a, um, it is a mystery book, but it, you know, I always wanted to know what was happening in the next chapter because there's a cliffhanger at the end of each one I've had, a few different conversations where I'm just casually describing this to people or someone asked me, what are you watching? What are you reading? And at least a couple of times where I describe this book and before I'm even done, 
I'm told by the other person, I, I just ordered it on Amazon. <laughs> so it's a, it's a very captivating story to, to almost anyone, I think. Oh, cool. Thank you. Thank you for your service. Um, uh, the, the family will be happy, Nick. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Well, I'll let you get back to your daughters. Thank you very much, Brian, for taking the time. I really enjoyed this. I am certainly going to follow you and follow all of the, the fields of study that are related to this as, as new discoveries emerge. Thank you. And uh, I try to keep things updated. I will be better at it next year, but it's, it's the immortality key.com. Uh, if you go there, you can see uh, this and all the other media appearances, updates on the film and other book projects. And I, I try to be good on Twitter. Uh, so uh, I'll keep you updated, man. Great. Well, thanks again, Brian, and, and have a great day. You too. Thanks, Nick.